Good evening, everybody, and you're very welcome to our Live at Grange programme this evening. The theme of tonight is farming in a more environmental, sustainable manner. In the studio, we have a group of experts who will address that topic. We will be discussing the area of animal genetics and breeding, more efficient use of fertilizers, and in particular, both organic and inorganic. We will be talking about the role of clover and its ability and possibility of replacing chemical fertilizer, in particular N. And we'll also be looking at water quality in our rivers and streams. So join us for a lively debate in the studio. Welcome to Live at Grange. We're coming here tonight from our studio at Grange. And tonight's program is part of the uh, week-long virtual Chagas Beef Week. Before I begin, I'd like to acknowledge the financial contribution of FBD. Tonight is a, an interactive panel discussion, so we'd like to have your involvement. You can contact the program on 51444 or on Twitter hashtag uh, Virtual Beef Week. And during the program, those contact details will appear at the bottom of your screen. The theme of tonight's, or the topic for tonight, is environmental sustainability, playing your part. So to set the context for tonight, if you travel across the countryside, be it spring, summer or autumn, you'll be struck by the sheer beauty and tranquility of the Irish landscape. The, virtue, or the visual landscape you see in front of you is a product of current and past farming activities. But behind that scene of tranquility and beauty, there are many complex interactions taking place. Many of these we as individuals cannot in the short term see. So for example, we have farmers working on the land, many struggling to make an income and struggling to be, sustain to be economically sustainable. On the other hand, we have societal and environmental sustainability, where things such as greenhouse gas production, ammonia emissions, water quality, biodiversity, habitat losses are all coming to the fore. The challenge for all of us who live and work on the land is, can we somehow marry those two potentially ch uh, different challenges together and in doing so have a win-win situation? A win for the farming environment and a win for the, for the natural environment. So that this win-win challenge that we're speaking about is a challenge we're putting to our panel tonight. So let us meet the panel. So first of all, let me introduce uh, Mark Plunkett. Mark is a plant and soil specialist uh, based at the Chagask Environmental Research Centre at Johnstown Castle. We're also joined by uh, Mike Egan, Mike is a grassland researcher uh, based at the Chagask uh, Research Centre in, in Moore Park in Fermoy County, Cork. We're also joined by Dr. Andrew Crummy. Andrew is an animal geneticist and works with the Irish Cattle Breeding Federation. And later in the programme, we'll be joined by Eddie Burgess, and Eddie manages the Chagask Water Catchment Programme. So again, you're all very welcome to the programme. We'll begin by speaking with Mark. And Mark's area of expertise is to do with fertilizer application, both organic and inorganic. But to put some context around what Mark is going to speak about, we'll have a look at this video. My name's Dominique Kroll, and we're in Johnstall Castle to talk about Gaisha's emissions from agriculture. There are two types of agricultural emissions, greenhouse gases like methane and nitrous oxide, and these are responsible for climate change, and air pollutants like ammonia that have negative impacts on human and animal health, while also uh, damaging ecosystems. I'm going to concentrate on ammonia emissions. Ammonia is a gaseous form of nitrogen. Uh, where it's lost in our agriculture is from uh, manure storage and land spreading, chemical fertilizer applications, and grazing animals. In Ireland, agriculture is responsible for 99% of ammonia emissions. 
uh, we've committed to reducing those emissions. However, since 2016, we've actually been exceeding our targets. So complying with these reduction targets is important as it underpins sustainability and green credentials of Irish agricultural production. Chagask has carried out extensive research into technologies to reduce these emissions, such as protected urea, low emission slurry spreading, clover, extended grazing, uh, slurry additives and so on. And the two top technologies that give the best results are protected urea and low emission slurry spreading. Protected urea is a fertilizer formulation that reduces emissions by over 70%. It's also cost effective and it's proven to be just as effective as other nitrogen formulations in um, getting the yield, uh, grass yield right. Low emission slurry spreading, such as straining shoe, has been proven to cut ammonia losses by half, while also improving nutrient use efficiency of the slurry. So it's very important that these technologies are adopted by farmers and become mainstream so that we can uh, meet our emission reduction targets. I have a trailing shoe since 2008. We were one of the earlier ones. There are several advantages. Nitrogen usage and uh, obviously the saving in that. It's significant over splash plate. Uh, the environmental, your emissions are a lot lower. Uh, obviously, which is important. Your smell and the effect of, on the environment on your neighbours is significant. Uh, your visual effect is almost, n you don't know you have spread it. And one other big advantage is you can spread it on grassland that has a reasonable amount of growth there, and you could graze cattle literally within a two days. They, they will graze it happily. They're an expensive machine to buy new, but the unit can be bought separately. Uh, to put on a good existing tanker. You probably would need a 120 horsepower tractor, not much more than is needed for a conventional splash plate. The dilution of the slurry is also very important and um, for the distribution in the field. And the other big advantage is you get a far more even spread. The benefit of using a trailing shoe in early April as against a splash plate after cutting silage is worth a significant amount of money in, in fertilizer usage. And I think in today's efforts to reduce carbon emissions on uh, farms, using splash plates really is an out of date method of spreading slurry, I think at this stage. And if we can use any other means of spreading that would improve our carbon footprint, I think we should be using it. So Mark, um, in that video we've heard Dominica outlining some serious challenges that her facing agriculture. And from the video I, I hear her speaking about the management of fertilizer, both organic and inorganic. And I think they're coming to the fore. So let's, let's discuss uh, what we can do in terms of making savings and contribution to the environment. So let's maybe take the, uh, the organic stroke slurries first of all. I guess every farmer that has cattle overwintered is produced, those cattle are producing organic manures, and in most cases they are in the liquid slurry format, okay? Maybe just take us through or talk us through just the nutrient content of those, those slurries, and maybe come to talk about the nitrogen content of the manures as well. Okay, Eddie. Um in terms of the nutrient value of cattle slurry, um, it, it's a valuable source of NP and K on farm. In terms of its NPK content, if we take you know, a spring application of, of cattle slurry uh, by splash plate, in terms of nitrogen, it contains five units of nitrogen, five units of phosphorus, and 32 units of potassium. Now that's a typical value for you know, average cattle slurry. Um, but it will range, you will have different you know, nutrient contents on farm, so I would encourage farmers to get their slurry tested, you know, to find out exactly what's in their slurry and how does it compare to the, the average value or the book value uh, for cattle slurry in terms of NP and K. It, it's also important, Eddie, to remember that it's actually available NP and K. It's the same as the, the fertilizer that we, we buy in terms of 18612 or 101020. So it's a valuable source of available nutrient and that can supply, you know, our crop requirement in terms of grass, grass silage requirements during the growing season. And I suppose the big challenge in terms of what Dominica has discussed earlier from a nitrogen point of view the, the P and K tends to be very stable in the slurry while the nitrogen tends to be I suppose more volatile. In cattle slurry there's two forms of nitrogen 
we have the organic nitrogen and it's in the solid part and it becomes available during the growing season as it breaks down and gets washed into the soil. But the part that we are most interested in you know, from an agronomy point of view and also from an environmental point of view is the available nitrogen. And half of the nitrogen cattle slurry is in the ammonium form. Okay, so that's the part maybe that we're interested in from the environmental point of view. So that half the nitrogen is in the ammonium form, that potentially can be, lo can be lost. Just talk to, us, talk to us now about how those losses maybe can be minimised. Okay, as I say, it's, it's plant available, it's in the ammonium form, and we can lose that nitrogen at the time of application or after application. It can be volatilised, it's a bit like urea fertiliser, it's in the, in the same form. Mm -hmm. So when it's converting from ammoni ammonia to ammonium, if we have in the right conditions there, um, and you know, if we apply it in the springtime, you know, we get those conditions, sort of cool, damp, calm, misty days, you know, they are the conditions that we will reduce losses and, and capture that nitrogen. Other things as well, um, in terms of application equipment, it sort of takes the, the weather factor out of it. You know, the likes of your trailing shoe, your band spreader. And what we're doing with, with that technology, Eddie, is that we're reducing the surface area of the slurry compared to the splash plate. As we know, the splash plate spreads the slurry in, in, in a film. So by reducing the surface area, we reduce the, the potential for loss and we retain more of that nitrogen in terms of growing grass um, on our farms during the, the growing season. Okay, and is the, uh, the advice or guidance still to try and put out that slurry in springtime and to put it back on the land from where the slurry originally originated from, which is the winter feed, which came from the silage ground. So that's the area where we're, we're going to, we're targeting slurry to go back onto the silage ground uh, to replace the nutrients that were taken off by, by the actual silage crop. Yes, Eddie, that is correct. Ideally, that's where the slurry should go, if you think about it. You know, we take the silage, we cut the silage, you know, in the springtime, we put it in the silage pits. It's the, the winter fodder, the animals eat it. We feed some meal, you know, over the winter as well, depending on the, the animal type. So we have a, a very, you know, a, a very good quality slurry. And yes, it should go back on the silage ground to replenish and I suppose keep the farm's nutrient levels in balance. So we put the slurry out to grow the next crop okay. or to replenish the soil, especially the P and K levels. So the P and K are, or we'll call them relatively stable in that yes. they're, they're available. It's the nitrogen was the one that we're worried about. Now talk to us about some, the way of ap applying it and what your research is showing in terms of new technology. Again, research from Johnstown Castle over a long number of years clearly shows that low emission spre spreading, the likes of the, the trailing shoe or the band spreader, reduces ammonia losses by up to 30 to 60%. So we're retaining, you know, a lot more nitrogen compared to splash, splash plate application. Yes. So I gave you a figure of five units of nitrogen per thousand gallons for a splash plate in the spring. We can push that to 10, 9, 10 units per thousand gallons. So if you take your, your typical crop of grass silage, mm -hmm. that's getting 3,000 gallons of cattle slurry in the spring, we can supply somewhere in the region of 27 to 30 units of that crop's nitrogen requirement. And that's approximately 30 to 40 percent of its nitrogen requirement uh, during the growing season. And again, that saves us money. In order to make the saving, we must reduce our chemical fertilizer coming onto the farm. So we can make the saving or, the, or the, you know, the saving in terms of the amount of chemical fertilizer we bring onto the farm. Okay, so in the video then, Dominica outlined the, the actual, uh, you know, the, the, the challenge we have with, 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 uh, with the, the, these fertilizers, but you have results showing that the challenges that's there in terms of gaseous losses can, can be abated with this new system. Maybe briefly then we'll turn maybe to the chemical fertilizers uh, that are being used. And again, as we heard, you know, there are challenges there. Absolutely. So tell us what are the current technologies that are available to help us to tackle those potential problems? Okay, the, t the two problems we have, number one is ammonia, which is mainly generated by agriculture, mm -hmm. and the other is that we have to reduce nitrous oxide by 10 to 15%. And we're very fortunate, again, we have a tried and tested technology in protected urea. Mm -hmm. And it's a double-sided kind. Okay. It reduces both ammonia losses and nitrous oxide losses. Okay. Okay, so then this protected urea that, that we're hearing about is relatively new on the, on the Irish landscape, if you wish. Maybe in a, in a few seconds we have left, talk to us, what is it? And, uh, and uh, are we able to spread urea throughout the season? Okay, what is it? No, it protected urea, it's ordinary urea with a urease inhibitor. Mm -hmm. And the urease inhibitor, it's like a shield or a protector. It protects when the, when the urea is converted to ammonium. And the trials show that it reduces losses by 
80%. Okay, so maybe then to, to, to finish up in, in, in with, with, with your discussion right now. In the beginning, uh, in the introduction, I had said that we're looking for win-win situations. So in terms of the, the area you're speaking about, just outline for the listeners, please, what the win-win in terms of balancing the environment and, 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 and the benefits for the farmer as well. The, I suppose the big win-win is that we're using nitrogen more f efficiently and we're reducing losses to the environment in terms of ammonia and nitrous oxide and also there's a cost saving then in terms of reducing the amount of chemical fertilizer that we have to purchase annually on our farms. Okay, so in terms of the environment then, we are seriously rising to the challenge to deal with, with the challenges coming at us. Okay, Mark, thank you very much for that. I'm sure we'll come back in the discussion later on with the public. There'll be lots of interest in that. So thank you very thank much you. indeed. Okay, so moving on then, next we're going to uh, speak with, with Mike Egan, and Mike is going to speak to us uh, about, about clover and the use of clover. And again, before we uh, go to Mike, we're going to have a, a look at a video that will help us to set context for what we're going to discuss. My name is Tim Marr. I'm farming here in Ross Gray, in Clonan, Ross Gray. Back in the early 2000s, we did the trials with Chagask um, on establishing clover, and that was quite positive. So we moved on, and I introduced it to quite a part of the farm at that stage. But then back in about 2010, we had a very wet year and lost quite a lot of clover through poaching. I went back with nitrogen after that and had a quite a high stocking rate. But then last year, Michael Daly brought us down to Solahead and it kind of renewed my interest in clover at that stage. As such, I said, I have a plot at home now that I'm going to try this on. And that's what I'm doing here today, where we have this group of heifers using no nitrogen and a low input and still getting the same results as what we were doing beforehand. We've included white clover here through two methods, really. Uh, historically, by oversowing, uh, using, doing small plots at a time, I had about a 50% success rate in doing that largely because of lack of moisture through the summer and the clover seed just died off. Um, but secondly, we have a tillage enterprise here as well and we rotate throughout the farm corn in a field for maybe three or four years and then go back in with grass seed. Here we, we introduce more clover seed in the, in the grass but an extra kilo per hectare and that's how we receded this plot that these heifers are on. The benefits I see from clover are that we reduce input use of chemical nitrogen has been reduced if not excluded completely. I also see that uh, my output is maintained. I need to do that. It's, I need to sell kilograms of meat off the farm and if I can maintain that with lower inputs that's my ideal. Thirdly I suppose there should be some good benefits for the environment. Clover swords are no harder to manage than any other type of grass. To utilize grass or grass clover swords we need good control. I've started off on this plot, we had five paddocks in it. Subsequently then I brought that up to 10 by just splitting the paddocks down the middle and I have since gone to 20. And it gives me much more control over the heifers when they're grazing it in that we can decide to move every day or every 36 hours as I like doing. It's, it's no harder to manage than uh, a, a, an ordinary pasture. One of the building blocks for clover before you start is to have your soil fertility right the farm is soil tested about a third of it every year and based on that with a target of getting to soil index 3 or maintaining soil index 3 we'll spread whatever is required. Spread the P and K throughout the season not all not all in the front and not all in the back end. Um, I think it helps the clover throughout the summer just that little bit of a boost at times and I'm only talking about a third of a bag or a half a bag maybe at a go every two months so it's, it's not a lot um, just to maintain it. And this lime then, if the pH is right, it's okay. But if I'm spreading lime, it's normally done maybe in January or the high pressure comes in in the winter, we spread it at that time of the year. The plan for the future would be that we'd continue to use clover, obviously. I intend carrying at least a ton, and I think maybe more next year, of livestock per, per acre on that. Um, so I'd, I'd, ho I'd hope over the next couple of years to have no nitrogen on this plot, plus probably introduced into it more of the farm as we go forward but I will continue to maintain the levels of clover that I have and probably uh, increase that. I'd have three take-home messages. Uh, firstly, have your soil fertility right before you start. Secondly, have a good control in that I mean have your paddock set up, your water in each paddock and make it easy for rotation. Thirdly then, uh, target areas. 
I think you should do a certain area of your farm and do it right. So Mark, um, clover has been used in receding mixtures for generations and yes in Ireland you know, Irish farmers have not really used clover or relied on it to replace and substitute for chemical fertilizer. So that's the past. We now hear even from the European Union as part of sort of farm to fork a, a new interest be, being shown in clover. So maybe it's very timely indeed that we should, should discuss that right now. Maybe again for the listeners, just maybe simply set out the scene. What would the advantages be of having clover in a grazing sward? Yeah, I suppose, thanks Eddie, I suppose that the three main areas that, that we have looked at in terms of the advantages are in terms of animal performance, herbage growth and sward quality, and I suppose the big one in, in terms of this topic is reduced chemical fertiliser. And when we look at the three of those together, what that means is we can uh, increase or maintain herbage production um, while having a higher sward quality. Uh, generally white clover has a higher crude protein and a lower fibre content, so by the animals eating this in, in the sward, it actually increases animal intake, which can in turn increase live weight gain by up to 13 to 14%. So it's a huge increase in animal performance. But I suppose the big win then is in terms of its ability to fix nitrogen from the atmosphere. So white clover is a plant that can take nitrogen in from the atmosphere, bring it into the plant, down into the roots and into the root nodules, um, and actually convert that into a plant usable source and release that nitrogen into the sward. Whereas the clover plant then can use it to to, to grow itself, but it can also release it into the ground so the companion grass or generally perennial ryegrass can use that to grow. And typical values of, of white clover in well-managed swards with high enough clover contents can fix anywhere between 80 to 100 kilos of nitrogen per hectare per year. So it's, it's quite substantial the amount of the savings okay, that it can so get. it can make a, a very significant contribution yeah. to, to, to farming activities. Yeah. I guess the challenge may be, and we heard it in the video um, with Tim, saying that, you know, when he was using tillage rotation and receding, he found it easy enough to, to establish clover. Yeah. But I guess in the beef environment where many pastures are permanent, so yeah. receding isn't a common practice, you know, there's a challenge of establishing clover in those wards. Can you give the listeners uh, some guidance and direction as maybe what's the best way to get it established yeah. in, existing, in permanent wards? And is there a timing issue around it? Yeah, I suppose, well, generally there's two main re er, methods of establishing clover. One is, in, as you touched on there, and Tim said it in the video as well, is a full reseed. So when you're doing your reseed, including white clover in the, in the seed mixture with the perennial ryegrass sward. And generally in terms of seeding rates, what we would talk in, in a full reseed with somewhere between one kilo an acre or two and a half to three kilos a hectare, mm -hmm. um, in generally included in the seed mix. And I suppose this is probably the gold standard of establishing clover because you're putting in a clover and a grass seed mix together and they're both growing and, and germinating at the same time mm -hmm. but you're not going to go and receive large areas of your farm every year and particularly in challenging times so I suppose the second method then is over sowing or, or putting ex white clover into an existing perennial ryegrass sward and this is a little more challenging because you're putting a new seed into a sward that is already growing um, and you're trying to get that new seed to germinate and persist against a rapidly growing ryegrass sward. So it is difficult um, and I suppose there are, there are key areas and timings in terms of methods and applications and how you can increase that success. Suppose the first one is timing. Yeah. The earlier in the year that you can do it, um, the better because it has long enough time before it comes into the winter, the cold period, uh, to get established. Um, and we talk about earlier, you're probably talking Mar um, the very end of March, depending on the year, April and up until May. And, and why earlier in the year is better? Because you have high enough soil temperatures to allow it, but you also have adequate soil moisture. Um, so to get that seed to persist into the sward and to get down into the ground, you need moisture in terms of getting the roots down into it um, and doing it. But I suppose the management after that is the big thing in terms of keeping the covers low enough. Okay. We, we heard or read during earlier in the year that maybe the availability of some clover-safe herbicides might be less available um, in, in, in the future. Yeah. Um, so if we're trying to establish maybe clover into existing permanent swards, would the approach be to use the herbicides first of all, get rid of the weeds yeah, so if, and then establish? If, if there is an existing or weed problem in, in the sward, um, a lot of these clover safe chemicals are going to be removed from the market of October of this year. Um, and if you purchase them in October this year, you can use them on your farm until October of 2021. Mm -hmm. Um, so there is a, a tight window of when we can use that. So if there is an existing weed problem on this ward, you are better to, uh, to, to control those weeds first with a non-clover-safe herbicide before you put them in. But I suppose the key thing around that in terms of 
an issue with it. A lot of these clover safe sprays have a residual effect in the soil. So once they're applied, uh, they can be anywhere from three to six months in terms of a residual effect of when you're actually able to put clover into this ward without damaging that clover seed. So just depending on the, the spray that you're using or the farmers are using, ensure the merchant and ask what that residual effect is or how long it is before you can put clover back into this ward. Okay. I probably should have said in the beginning when I introduced you that while you'll be leaving the, the discussion at the end of this session, I should have encouraged the, the public actually, anyone who's an interest in, in using Clover and wants a question to be posed to Mike, you might come in at, uh, at uh, 51444 or, or on the, the, uh, the, the Twitter feed as well. Uh, so apologies for not uh, saying that up front. Okay, so thank you for outlining how we get Clover uh, in, into this ward. I guess the other challenge that we have is, once we have it there, is actually maintaining it. And I suppose going back over the years, you know, work has been done uh, in terms of having clover there. But it seems from year two and year three, it, there seems to be an inevitable decline. So again, from your new work and work that's ongoing, can you give some further guidance as to how we might maintain that clover in this ward? Yeah, so one of the issues that you raised already was establishing clover into this ward, but another thing is keeping it there long term and getting that actual animal production value, sward value and nitrogen benefit from it. So the best thing that we can do, and Mark already touched it in terms of soil fertility, and Tim said in the video, having that correct soil fertility, the optimum soil fertility, so index 3 for P and K, and having your lime stat as a 6.3 to 6.5. So if you can get that right first, it is going to help in terms of maintaining that clover in this ward long term, but also your grazing management of that. So if you can keep in the middle of the season a short rotation of um, 20 to 25 days in terms of allowing light down to the base of the sward, ensuring that you graze your swards tight enough so that the, the grass plant isn't growing much taller than the clover plant and shading and smothering it out. But generally after four or five years you will generally see a small decline in it and work by James Humphreys in the solid head farm that, that Tim mentioned earlier would have shown that on a, on a five year basis, if you're over sowing 15 to 20% of your farm yearly to maintain and increase the level of clover in those swords, it will be a benefit in, in the long run. Okay, so obviously going with that annual top up on the, on the proportion of yeah, the farm. so like if of the swords that are the oldest and you can, generally you'll have paddocks that are, are yeah. starting to decline more often, yeah. but rather than letting them fall out completely, if you can top up the clover seed in that. And, and one thing I should have said earlier when we're talking about over sowing, we need a slightly higher re seeding rate in terms of the over sowing versus the, the reseeding. And, and generally in an over sowing capacity, you're talking about two to two and a half kilos of clover seed per acre are up to five or 5.5 kilos of clover seed per hectare. Okay, so what there is in maybe an ongoing sort of maintenance cost if you wish to, yes. to, to do that, but it's only a proportion of the farm. Um, I suppose that the other part, and I think um, Tim referred to it, in that maybe he said that one year weather was poor, wet, and he did some poaching damage and it affected the clover. Yeah. I mean, have we some guidance to give farmers in relation to how we manage yeah. it? So generally clover it grows by stoloniferous uh, patterns, so it doesn't have a, an individual tiller root structure like perennial ryegrass, so it grows along the ground by stolons. Um, and in very, very wet weather, uh, if we damage that stolon, or, uh, you can damage and, and uh, reduce the amount of clover in this ward. But I suppose what Tim was talking about was, was open mm -hmm. 10, 15 years ago, and yeah. I suppose we've moved forward a lot in terms of the cultivars that we're using since then. A lot of the cultivars that Tim had included on that farm were large leaf clovers, um, very large leaf clovers that aren't very well suited to grazing scenarios. So the new cultivars that we're looking at are your medium and your small leaf clover cultivars for yeah. cattle and small for your, for your sheep grazing. Okay. These are a lot more persistent in this ward. They generally don't yeah. leave as much open, uh, openness okay. in this ward and they're, they're not as susceptible as poaching. But generally you do need to watch okay. that you don't damage the sport. I see a question come in here on, on the, from the public asking, you know, um, uh, Pat from Offaly, uh, can there be too much clover in the field? Yeah, there can be too much clover and we, we've seen that in some of our trials in Moorpreck and Clonakilty that when we go above 45-50% um, dry matter of clover in this ward, we can get issues in terms of, number one, open pastures in the spring, um, like that can be damaged and low uh, low growth rates over winter and in the spring if it's very, very high, um, and also can cause animal problems in terms of bloat as well with excessively high levels of clover content. Generally, that is only in, in a case that we have seen is when clover is included in silage paddocks or silage swards, that when we cut off the, the first and second cut silage, you're left with a yellow base of the sward. The clover, because it has its own nitrogen store, comes back much, much faster and actually outcompetes the grass. So generally we, we're not recommending including uh, white clover in silage swards because you get that clover dominance uh, of them. Okay, maybe one last question before our time runs out, and that is, so if a farmer is interested in putting uh, clover into his pasture, uh, are we saying that you know it should be a section of the farm that's taken separately? Yeah. 
clover established and a group of animals put onto that so they're always on the clover swords rather than hit and miss coming and going. Yeah, I suppose if, if you have your farm, you're not going to go and recede all as a farmer over so at all. I think if you focus on a, on a smaller proportion of the farm, whether it be 20, 30% of your farm, number one, get your soil fertility correct on that. Yeah. It's going to be a lot easier to establish and maintain it in the sward. So get the soil fertility right on a smaller proportion of your farm, then include it by a, by a combination of receding yeah. and over sowing um, and keep it like Tim is, has a smaller area of a farm, have those animals on it and then increase it across the farm over, over a multi-year approach. Okay, so and maybe finally to come back to my original uh, kind of challenge I posed in yeah. the beginning. So on the win-win. So just again, simply say for us what's the win-win both for the environment and for the farmer the win-win if, if we get enough adequate clover in our sward of averaging 20 25 percent in the year we can increase our animal performance by up to 13 percent we can maintain herbage production and reduce our chemical fertilizer which is going to save money for the farmer but if we reduce our chemical fertilizer it's going to have huge benefits for the environment um, as well as eddie will cover later on okay that's thank you very much Nick mike and we greatly appreciate your, your, your input Okay, so we'll then be uh, turning to our attention to, to, uh, to Dr. Andrew Crummy, who is an animal geneticist. Again, but to set the scene in terms of what Andrew is going to speak about, let's look at this video. Uh, Billy and Niall Nicholson here farming uh, in Crasshaven, County Cork. Uh, we're farming in a partnership. We're a beef and tillage farm, uh, fattening all our own male cattle, plus buying a few wheeling bulls uh, for fattening also. All are done as under 16 month bulls and uh, breeding all our own replacements uh, and fattening the remainder of the heifers 22 to 23 months of age usually. We kill all our, our male cattle uh, under 16 months. They've currently just recently all gone. Um, they're killed, I think, this year, uh, 407 kilos at just under 16 months of age. Uh, majority of them use a handful of ours, of course, through them as well. Uh, and the heifers then are killed at 22, 23 months of age, killing about 340 kilos. Uh, a handful of ewes there, but the majority of them ours. We have uh, a 364 day calving interval here for the past calving season. We have uh, 0.99 calves per cow per year and we have 85% uh, I think of the cows calved in, in this first six weeks. So on the farm here we've been in uh, BGDP for the last, uh, we're in our sixth year this year and that's massively helped us to focus really on uh, the replacement index and make sure that we're only breeding from four and five star animals. Uh, we put a keen focus on that uh, here on the farm and we've really focused with that together with uh, the beep from last year and bringing in the data from the weights of the animals and showing us which cows are actually performing. We're keen to have these uh, high producing four and five star animals because the economically they're delivering for us on farm um, they're keeping our farm sy farming system profitable and uh, they're making sure that the suckler farming here on this farm is sustainable yeah uh, the farm is, is currently in glass and we had been in reps prior to that we have um, I think behind us here you can probably see trees that we set there a number of years ago we've also we set 250 meters of hedgerow there for glass three or four years which is for, coming to a lovely hedge at this stage uh, I, I'm also very interested in nature I love to see wildlife and birds around uh, we have some uh, barn owls uh, and recently we've had uh, Buzzards come back onto the farm, which we're delighted with. They're doing a great job on the rabbits for us here anyway. Uh, so, you know, I, I always like to see uh, wildlife around and we have quite a few trees also. Uh, farming here at a stocking rate of 2.2 uh, livestock units per hectare, we're still focused on biodiversity because it's important to maintain nature and maintain hedgerows on the farm. Um, like as, as, as farmers, all we are really is custodians of the land while also trying to do the best we can uh, on farm and produce as much uh, kilos of live weight as we can. Andrew, in the video clip we have just seen, uh, Billy and Niall outlined production and efficiency targets. They mentioned the figure of 0.99 of a calf per cow per year a 364-day calving interval and 85% of the cows calving in six weeks. 
which just maybe set their standard versus the typical average farm or even the top 25%. Where do they sit or where do farmers sit relative to them? Well, certainly, I think you can see, Eddie, from the, the video, they really are achieving exceptional performance. And, and if we compare that with the, the sort of the national average figures, they're achieving 0.99 calves per cow per year. That's against a national average of about 0.85 calves per cow per year. They're achieving a, a six-week calving rate of 85% compared to 52%. And in terms of calving interval, they're 364 days against 401 days. So there's no doubt about it. They're, it's, it's, it's exceptional performance. But they're doing it through really the uh, early adoption and, and use of, of, of new technologies to really help to drive on performance on the farm. And, and that's not just the breeding technologies. You know, certainly there were early adopters of the whole um, uh, Eurostar replacement indexes. In fact, they were ahead of that in terms of their replacement policy on the farms. There's, there's 12 or 15 years of, you know, use of, of really improved genetics in terms of those maternal traits that have been going on in that farm and then in addition to that they're complementing that with not just the breeding technologies but some of the other technologies that we're talking about here this evening such as you know trailing shoe biodiversity the other aspects that you would have picked up on the farm use of clover so really getting exceptional performance on the farm okay so in their on their farm they have been using obviously the technologies you outlined and many of these have been promoted by by yourselves in icbf and obviously Chagas are, are promoting those as well. So really maybe just for people listening, so look, so what are the guidelines and help that, that, help that are available to help farmers move from the national average you know, to levels where these people are at? I mean, these are impressive targets, uh, obviously highly efficient. So just maybe briefly talk, talk us through what, are, what is available that will help farmers to, to, to move in the direction they have gone to. Well, the first thing I would encourage farmers to do is, is engagement in the programs that are out there. And, and there are a lot of really positive programs now. I know the Beef Data and Genomics program copped a, a, a bit of flack in its early years. Some would say it was ahead of its time. And arguably, it perhaps was, but it has positioned us now into a great place with regard to the, you know, being able to really demonstrate the opportunities that there are around the carbon efficiency gains that can be achieved from the suckler herd. So the BDGP is now coming to the end of that, that programme. And of course, it has been complemented in many ways by, by the Beef Environmental Efficiency Pilot. Now, that was a pilot last year around uh, weighing cows and calves. And people said that farmers wouldn't do it. You know, the Nicholsons have been doing it for 15 or 20 years. But last year, you know, we got a good uptake in the programme. And this year, in terms of that has converted to a new programme with the Department of Agriculture. And you know, there's 27,000 beef farms involved in the programme now, weighing 700,000 cows and calves that will be weighed in, in 2020. So it really helps to demonstrate. It's, they're great examples of, you know, policy meeting practice. So where policy is really supporting the industry in terms of its, its needs and requirements for the future. And that then gives a great basis in terms of data and tools, which organisations such as ICBF, Chagas, Borbia, etc. Okay. can then help to pick up and, and use whether it's the Eurostar replacement index or the carbon navigators, etc. to really help to further improve that animal efficiency, that herd efficiency, and, 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 the, and demonstrating and improving the climate efficiency of our suckler okay, herd. Okay, I'm sure we, we'll come back to that again in a moment, but maybe as someone looking into the programme tonight, maybe who is not a, a farmer, or maybe come from wearing a more environmental hat, they say, what these guys talking about? There was supposed to be some mention of sustainability here and then tonight. Just link what you've just said to the whole issue of sustainability because it's important. Yeah, and, and this is where the, the real win-win is. And, and I know both Mark and Mike have talked about that as well. And, and, and certainly in the context of the breeding piece, you know, the gains that farmers want and need in terms of calves per cow per year, in terms of younger age at slaughter, in terms of improved female fertility, uh, in terms of improved growth rate. I mean, that's all completely consistent with, we we'll call it climate and environmental benefits. And whenever we actually look at that in the context of the, the current rates of gain that we're achieving now in the suckler herd as a consequence of the replacement index, and our initial indications we were certainly very, very confident based on the biological models that 
By improving these traits, we were going to actually also reduce the carbon footprint, reduce the total methane output of our suckler herd. And that now has been validated. So, um, and, and some of your viewers, or I'd encourage people to look back at the pieces from this morning where the Tully, at the Tully Performance Test Station, again, Department of Agriculture funded programs with Chagas involved. And we're actually really seeing that these high indexed animals are not only delivering in terms of the productivity gains that farmers need, but they're actually doing it with lower total methane output, which is a fantastic win-win. Uh, and when you start to put that into real figures, yeah. you know, if we look at the sort of gains that are now happening in the suckler herd, you know, and if we project forward to 2030, well, there's a 100 euro additional profit opportunity there for farmers but it's going to come with three, four percent less methane output at a per cow level. Okay. And there's opportunities to push that further. So that seems very exciting that not alone by improving technical efficiency at farm level, that's enhancing sustainability, but the cattle are on the this face of the earth for maybe a shorter period of time. When they're there, they're being productive. But also the important point is that through genetic advances, we're also having animals that individually produce less methane. So that's a, that's a real, real win-win. Maybe the last maybe question before we close this particular section is maybe in the broader context, you know, where does the Irish suckler herd sit in the context of overall, overall sustainability, maybe in, in, compared to an international context? Well, certainly in an international co context and, and, and looking at the board, we know we're very carbon efficient and that's a very, very good story, you know, in terms of our carbon footprint of our national herd. I think we're fourth in, in, in overall terms. But... The real opportunity is the infrastructure that we have in, in Ireland around, you know, the collection of the data, the programmes that we have in place. I mean, the, the, our beef cattle breeding database is the largest in the world. 15 million animals with the level of genotyping that's happening, you know, with our focus around breed improvement across the range of breeds and using the commercial data. So it gives us a great foothold or a starting point to really drive on that genetic gain opportunity. So it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a fantastic opportunity. And we're also very, very fortunate that we have in many ways a unique eco ecosystem here in Ireland, where again, I come back to the policy meeting practice piece, where we have this great interaction happening between government and between the agencies and with farmers and the industry that gets all of these synergies really working for farmer, for industry and also for consumer benefits and that's where the real plus pluses are Eddie. Okay Andrew thank you for that and I'm sure there'll be lots of discussion for, from the public here in a few moments. I should have welcomed of course Eddie to the stage before I introduced Andrew so you, you are welcome. Um, so Eddie is going to speak to us about uh, water quality and I said Eddie manages the Jaguska water catchment program and again, maybe to set the context from where we're going to go in discussing this with Eddie, we have a look at this video. I'm Eddie Burgess and I'm managing the Agricultural Catchments Programme, which is funded by the Department of Agriculture, Food and the Marine. The Agricultural Catchments Programme has been established to evaluate the actions and regulations that farmers have to adhere to under European regulation to achieve good water quality. And to do that, we have six small catchment areas located across the country. And we have a number of pieces of equipment for monitoring water quality. This morning, we are at the main piece of, of equipment. It's our outlet and we have a bankside analyzer, which is taking a sample every 10 minutes and analyzing it here on site for nitrate, phosphate, in addition to pH, turbidity, temperature, conductivity. In addition to monitoring the concentration of nutrient in the water, we're also measuring the flow or the discharge or the amount of water that leaves the catchment. And we know how much water leaves and we know the concentration in it and you multiply one by the other and we know how much nutrient, so how much nitrogen or how much phosphorus leaves the catchment over a given period. We could say for a year or after a particular heavily, heavy rainfall event. And this gives us an understanding of the processes involved in nutrient loss. We have found over the last 11 years that their soil type has a major influence on the nutrient that leaves the catchment. 
It's not the only factor. The weather also has a major impact on whether you have nitrogen or phosphorus loss and whether it's, it's a lot or very small. And in addition to that, the farmer practice, which is probably the least uh, significant factor, but also has a major impact. And all three of those overlap with each other. And really, because we don't have the same weather everywhere and don't have the same soil type across the country, what one farmer practice needs to be on one soil type differs greatly from what another farmer's practice needs to be on a contrasting soil type to achieve good water quality. My name is Martin Shattensey. I live in Romford, Hallamount, County Mayo. Uh, I'm a suckler and sheep farmer. I have 18 suckler cows and 120 breeding ewes. Well, as first of all, when they came out and they took site samples of the whole farm, they said that the lime and the pea had to be rectified. So how did I rectify these issues? First of all, as the lime was down, I put two tons to the, the acre of lime. I also used, I targeted the fields with P and K that were down, with straight compounds and, and phosphorus and potassium. Um, as I was down in, in, in very indexed low levels on P, I'd done a course in the in P build-up course, and it allowed me to spread more P. The biggest changes that started the programme, I suppose, um, I found out that I, I, I'm a mean glass for the low emission slurry, which means uh, putting it out the trail and shoe. I suppose fields that are down in P and K and targeted them. So why are these changes important to the catchment? So water quality is a big thing around here. We have the best water quality in the six catchments. It's down to the farmers in the area. They're known where you're putting it, no wastage of your P and K. Um, you're targeting the fields that, that need it, not overuse. As I've saved money and, and not wasting putting out extra P and K when I don't need it in the fields. I only put it out in the fields I want it. What eutrophication is, is a growth in algae, and that algae takes dissolved oxygen out of the water, and that results in small uh, animals that don't survive with lower oxygen levels. And water quality is assessed. There is a Q value giving on, on water quality based on the ecology that is living in the riverbed. And unfortunately, in recent years, that Q value has been fallen in freshwater streams across the country, particularly the really good ones have been dropping back. On the other side of the equation, major pollution instances over a long term trend have also been fallen and there tends to be uh, a movement of water quality towards the middle and it needs to be slightly higher than that. Uh, phosphorus is the nutrient that causes problem in freshwater. Nitrogen tends to be more of an issue when you get into salty water into the sea and in our estuaries where you have tidal water it's a combination of both nitrogen and phosphorus that will impact on these oxygen levels and cause eutrophication. So Eddie we know that on the vast majority of farms throughout the country most farms have a stream or a river uh, close by to them not to mention the vast reserves of water that are, that are in the soils on, on, under their feet. So obviously farmers have a vested interest eh, in water, wa water quality. And obviously if something goes wrong sort of upstream, you know, it has consequences for, for what's downstream. So maybe again for the audience just listening, just t what do we mean by water quality? Yes, Eddie, well, w water quality can mean different things in different places. And you mentioned about uh, water underground, underfoot. And a, a lot of us have groundwater wells that we'd use for drinking water. And a drinking water standard um, is a different thing to what I was largely showing in the video there earlier where I was doing the kick sampling and talking about the Q value. Mm -hmm. um, so we could, there are different parameters or different things that we measure to look for the water quality. And with drinking water, we look at the nutrient content and we're not looking at the life that's living on the ground because there isn't any. Okay. Another thing we'd be concerned about would be uh, chemicals getting into the water. Right. Uh, a significant concern in, in a lot of drinking sources would be MCPA right. get, getting in there. Okay. But that's not really the concern of ours. We're not looking massively. We, we do look into that, but the, our main concern in the catchments program is looking at the nutrient content in the, in the water. Mm -hmm. and, and, um, that, as I explained in the video, has an impact on what lives in the riverbed. Mm -hmm. And in freshwater bodies, so we're talking about rivers, streams and lakes, uh, the, the water quality, is that, that life is, is affected by phosphorus and by sediment. Okay. 
you know, and, and, and that's, that's the nutrient of concern in, in those. Okay, so do we, is, is it, so for most farmers, I guess, who are on rivers and streams, it's the fresh water we're talking about rather than maybe coastal areas and estuaries. Yeah. Sorry, Eddie, just, no? just to put in that, it, it, you have to keep in mind, you could be a farmer in a thigh, yes. in, the, in the middle of County Kildare, and the rain falls on your land and it rains that land, that will end up in the estuary at some stage. Of course, yeah. So nitrogen is an issue for a farmer there, and it could be very difficult for someone who doesn't live in a coastal county to comprehend that their management will have an impact on water that will end up in the sea. Okay, okay. So then... We saw in, in, the, in the video that I think it was you used, you said it yourself, I think that, you know, in terms of factors affecting water quality, you mentioned soil type, you mentioned weather, and obviously farm practice. So I mean, what, what's been done or can be done on, in each of those to minimise the impact on water quality? Yeah, a, a, a huge amount has, has been taking place. Um, for a start, it's in, it, it's in the farmer's own interest. We heard Matt on the video there speaking with a great sense of pride with, of the six catchments there in the catchment that they had the best water quality. And farmers have a great sense of pride and, and, and care for the quality of the environment that, that they're working in. And two of our six catchments have uh, group water supply schemes on them and, and, and they have a vested interest in that water quality being good. But the type of things that have happened over the years, we, we all have to adhere to the good agricultural practice regulations or the nitrates directive. Um, there has been a, a, a series of schemes running from REPS, AOS, GLOSS, and also there's an amount of investment now uh, gone in when the nitrates came in first under the building grant scheme for the farm waste management and also with uh, the TAMS grant scheme now at the moment. Okay, so really nationally, and at farm level, a lot of investment has, is being put in place to preserve or enhance uh, water quality. Yes, a huge amount, a, a, a huge effort has gone in. Mm -hmm. And um, I suppose people could be confused because more recently we, there have been reports, in the last two years, reports have been published by the EPA um, outlining a fall in water quality nationally. And agriculture is one of many industries that has been associated with this fall in water quality. And you could ask, this does not tally with the efforts that have been made. Now, for, first of all, to explain, the, the, there is a grading system on, on water quality, mm -hmm. a five-point grade, very similar to carcass classification. And um, the, the, the poorer water quality bodies are a lot less than they were uh, 20 years ago. Okay. So there has been an improvement. The really badly polluted water bodies are a lot lower in number than, than, what, uh, than, than what was the case. Okay. But unfortunately, our, our really good quality water bodies are also falling in number. Okay. Okay. So maybe that's obviously a worry. Now, um, sort of in the sort of earlier on the, 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 in the video, you know, you mentioned about fertilizer application. Is it a case that good farm practice can alleviate a lot of these potential issues? And by that I mean, you know, is it a case of the right fertilizer in the right place at the right time at the right rate? Now, it's being a bit maybe a too simplistic, but, you know, can good farm practice where we adhere to the weather and we do things like that and we adhere to soil nutrient management fertilizer plans, is that how we're going to do our utmost to enhance water quality. It, it, it is. It, um, it's one of it's. It's a major part of it, Eddie. And 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 again, you you're asking about the win-win and nutrient efficiency. Um, it, as Mark mentioned, is, is a benefit for a farmer's pocket, but also it's a benefit in that we don't have loss of nutrients. Mm -hmm. But I mentioned that phosphorus is a main concern for for nutrients in freshwater bodies. And unfortunately, it takes a very, very small amount of phosphorus to cause a problem. And with, with the monitoring that we're doing, we can establish that in, of all our catchments, um, even on the ones that have a bigger phosphorus problem, it's at the end of a year, there's less than one unit of phosphorus per acre being lost in, in the stream, leaving the stream at the end of the year. Okay. And, and um, we could cut the total rate. And I would like to say to you that if we all cut our unit uh, rate of application by one unit that we would solve our water problem. Mm -hmm. But unfortunately, that, that won't do anything. It's when we spread it and where we spread it. 
and the ground conditions and the weather that follows that will have a much bigger effect than the total okay. overall rate. And maybe finally, and it's probably it's, it's a, maybe an unfair question in some ways, you've been involved in the water catchment programme for what I think is 11 years. Um, what changes have you seen in, in, in it? And maybe just important, are there things happening that worry you in terms of the maintenance of water quality or enhancing it? Um, well, over, over the 11 years, uh, up until three years ago, the national report on water quality was, uh, every time that it came out, was either showing an improvement or the water quality stayed the same. Mm -hmm. So uh, of major concern is that in the last two reports that came out, there was a slight decline in water quality, and, uh, and, that, and that is significant. And more... Um, um, I'll, more specifically looking, of looking ahead and also in the more recent past, I think the, since the dairy quotas went, the increase in intensification has been associated um, with the eastern and southern part of the country and, and ri 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 higher nitrate levels okay. in the water. And I think that this will be a concern going, looking ahead. Okay, so, just, so my comment then is, so really we were going in a, in a good direction, maybe we ha have, have stalled there for a while, and I suppose, again, you know, for a country like Ireland that exports such a large amount of our, of our produce, be it da dairy or beef or our lamb, you know, we, we trade on our green credentials. If someone, you know, in another country can read that water quality is deteriorating in Ireland, that's not a, a good news story for us, really, is it? No, it's, it's not a good news story. But having said that, our water quality is, is one of the best in Europe, and we are at a good place. But if we want to keep it moving in the right direction, we're obliged to do that under European regulation, but regardless of that, we need to do it to be able to sell our agricultural produce. Okay, so the good news part is that, you know, our quality by and large is, is very, very high compared to European standards, but we, we can't rest on that. We, we have to, we need to, to improve. And you outlined the win-win situation, things that can be done at, at, at farm level. Okay, Eddie, thank you very much for that. Now, at this stage, we will open up the discussion to uh, comments from the public. And on my, my, my laptop here, on, on, on the side of my tablet, there's a, a lot of, uh, of, of uh, questions coming in. There's a question to, to Andrew uh, about uh, genotyping animals. What more can it bring to the equation? What more information can it give over and above, let's say, using the, the five-star index? Okay, so, um, and, and of course, uh, you know, a farmer could just pick bulls based on that replacement index and, and, and sort of what, what sort of rate of gain would he, would he achieve as a consequence of that and, and the benefits that genotyping brings. Well, the BDGP was designed to, yes, use those, those five-star replacement index bulls, but then whenever you get your heifers on the ground and you might have 10 heifers and you need three or four of them, it's about making sure that you pick the best three or four. And whether we like it or not, there's going to be uh, ancestry errors that genotyping helps to create to, to address and that was discussed here last night we know the figure is 10 to 15 percent of ancestry errors so straight away by having a genotype you've corrected that problem and you could be you know picking an animal that you wouldn't mm -hmm. would wouldn't want to pick if you had the genotype data and the other benefit that it brings is it actually does help to the use of the dna data to, to draw out the better animals in terms of those more favorable traits for maternal for the carcass growth traits, etc. So the sort of the the level of gain that you're looking at as a consequence of genotyping is in the order of 30%. So instead of moving your herd at five euros per year, you're moving your herd at seven or eight euros per year, and that's the direct benefit of genotyping. And I suppose Eddie, that's one of the reasons why in any future program. And we're looking at that in terms of enhanced levels of genotyping potentially to help us focus in on these new traits, aged slaughter. We've talked about the methane peaks earlier on. And even last night, it came up very, very strongly in the context of beef from the dairy herd. And those beef farmers that are buying calves from the dairy herd, they also want to know what they're buying and they want to know what they're, th what they're like for these traits that are important in the context of beef production. So genotyping is a very, very significant part of the so overall I, equation. Put, put simply then, we're saying that if we can use an animal's own DNA, we can help to screen and understand what genes is carrying for certain traits, and, and that's and, using and, new technologies. And, and place the animals in the different into the different pathways that we want, whether it's replacement or slaughter, beef from the dairy herd, etc. Okay. And another question coming in here. Thank you, Andrew, for that. Another question coming in here from Sean and Claire is to do with uh, urea. Uh, you know, can urea be? Uh, it says, uh, are all ureas the same? And why can they not be basically mixed with, with, with P and K? So I guess, um, Mark, that's more, more for you. Okay, Eddie. Um, yeah, that's a very good question. Um, 
there we have um, three different uh, ureas active ingredients. They're all they're all the same. They're all um, they all do the same job in terms of reducing uh, ammonia emissions when you know they can be either coated or uh, incorporated into the urea granule. Um, in terms of you can have the the straight. Uh, protected urea, 46% nitrogen. You can also have protected urea plus sulfur, and you can have protected urea plus potassium. So there is a good range of products. The only ingredient that we can't mix currently with uh, protected urea is phosphorus, because it breaks down the urea as inhibitor very, very rapidly. But in terms of supplying P and K in a fertilizer program, I would be encouraging people towards maybe something like N18612, you know, you know, in the first or second round during the growing season, and then switch back to maybe a straight urea, protected urea, or a urea plus sulfur. Okay, another question coming in here from John in, in Wicklow. He asks, he says, I used a trailing shoe last year and it left a row of slurry in the silage. And is this normal or was it the machine? Uh, yeah, we, we, we see that. And again, we are putting the, the slurry in, in a band, either with the trailing shoe or the band spreader. And I suppose it can be a combination of, of factors, Eddie. It, it can be down to maybe a, a, a thick slurry at a high application rate. And again, the type of weather that follows. Again, if you get a dry spell of weather, after we can see these lines but in general it's not a problem i suppose in terms of alleviating the problem or managing the problem i suppose just watch it at the time of year you know what i mean if it's getting say moving into the month of april and you're going into a heavy cover of grass say before closing up for silage again maybe you know watch the weather make sure there's rain coming afterwards or another useful tip as well is that diluting the slurry again it, it makes the slurry you know, more workable, it improves the nitrogen efficiency, and also it's easier on the machine as well. Okay, sure, yes, absolutely, Eddie, yes. On, on the trailing shoe there, yes. like the trailing shoe is designed to, to lower emissions yes. um, uh, for, um, uh, to, to the atmosphere, but mm -hmm. from a water quality point of view, I think the trailing shoe has huge benefits as it allows farmers to spread slurry when you have a cover of grass during the growing season right. when ground conditions are better. And if ground conditions are better, you'll have less loss through runoff. OK, I think, unfortunately, the clock has caught up with us. And I think we could spend another hour discussing uh, what we're discussing now, because literally uh, my tablet here is literally lighting up. And I apologize to the, to the people for, for not having maybe more time. Maybe we'll revisit it again. So it is left then to me, first of all, to thank uh, Eddie, uh, Mark, uh, Andrew, and Mike, who has, who has left us. And of course, especially to thank you, the public, for joining us. But maybe before uh, we leave, I want to thank one or two more, or more people. While I sat up here tonight asking the questions, you saw all the videos, a lot of work has been done by the, the uh, coordinators of tonight's show, and that's Sinead Waters and Martina Harrington. So thank you very much there in the background, waving at me here, uh, smiling at me and sending me rude, uh, rude, rude texts here. Also, we want to thank um, the, the, the t television crew, and particularly Declan McArdle from Chagas, who has been leading that, and of course the AgriLand crew, we greatly appreciate the effort. And I suppose also a lot of the social media activities that take place uh, every day are coming through Chagas PR, and we want to, to thank them as well. And before I finally leave, and not to go over time totally, you know, the, our virtual beef week continues tomorrow. So again, there's a broadcast at uh, 12 o'clock tomorrow and again tomorrow night. And the theme or the focus of tomorrow is building, a resili building resilience into your grassland system. So again, thank you for join joining us and take care. <laughs>